God's word comes from the Gospel of Luke. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Jesus was sent to bring peace between God and humanity. Jesus doesn't come to smooth over our conflicts, nor does he come with armies to force us to lay down our weapons. Instead, he comes to give his own life for the sins that are at the heart of our rebellion against him. The Prince of Peace takes upon himself our sins and our unrest. To receive his peace, we willingly surrender and receive his forgiveness and shalom. Now let us pray together. Holy Lord, forgive us our selfish rebellious hearts. We open ourselves to you today and invite you to enter our lives and grant us your peace. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all here for the second Sunday of Advent. And thanks to the Here We Stand Committee for the lighting of the candles today. If you don't know what they are, chaired by Bob Blakey, uh, they're in charge of the structure, the roof, the floor, the walls, and everything in between. So if you're interested in joining that committee, get with Bob, and he'd like to have you to come along. Um, thank you. Candace. And Gregory got married yesterday, so they're on their honeymoon, and we're honored to have the Reverend Warner Durnell and his wife, Cassandra Ann Walters Durnell. It's not his wife? Couldn't tell with the mask on. That's, that's actually my oldest daughter. We didn't rehearse that. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to call her Clarice. Okay. <laughs> Nice to have you here, Clarice. I didn't think you looked old enough, but you know, I just want to make sure. Anyway, a couple other announcements. Remember, not that you're old. Somebody else want to do this? Okay. Anyway, today is the last day to turn in your poinsettia dedications. If you've already ordered one, you might want to think about ordering another one for your neighbor, your friend the mailman, somebody else who would appreciate it at this time of the year. Um, you can stop by the table at downstairs lobby and pick up your gift cards for alternate Christmas, and that is due next Sunday. Also next Sunday, the Christmas cantata concert is gonna be here. We have different folks from out of town that are gonna be joining our group here to sing uh, one that we've done before, and it's very, very good cantata. You'll love it. You may even want to sing along with it. So please come and bring friends next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Uh, staff Christmas offering, and because I'm liturgist today, I guess I'm part of the staff. So make sure you appreciate what they do around here with a gift. They will appreciate it. And uh, also I would like to honor my mother, Mina Ring, who turned 92 yesterday. And welcome back the folks from Thanksgiving, like the Youngs from Wisconsin. Welcome back. Do they have snow there? Yeah. Good. <laughs> I, like, I like snow. All right. With all those announcements said, if you will get up and share God's peace with your neighbors and friends for a moment. Yes. Who does? Dr. Moffat. Happy birthday, Dr. Moffat. Would you like us to sing? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, my and Dr. Moffitt, happy birthday to you. All right.
right, any other birthdays coming up or anything we should recognize? Okay, well, if you'll stand up and share God's peace with your neighbors, please.
follow along, please, with the call of worship. Make his paths straight. That's what you say. <laughs> I will say, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled. And every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough place shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. If you will please remain standing and turn to him, page 154, uh, verses 1 through 4 of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. What? God is with us and for us. In Jesus, waiting to be merciful to all who are sorrowful for their sins. Let us, in penitence and faith, humbly confess our sins. Almighty God, your watch and care over us this evening. Though we forget you have not taught us, though we do not you, you have not denied us. May the God of mercy, who through Christ Jesus forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in our, our goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. <laughs> heads, please. Grant to us, O Lord, 
that in these moments of listening to the word read and proclaimed, the grace to hear and the will to obey what your spirit says to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First scripture reading for today is Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 5. It's in your pew Bible, page 816, if you'd like to follow along. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and her penalty is paid. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. Now if you'll stand please and sing hymn number 152, Prepare the Way, O Zion. second reading for this second Sunday in Advent are two passages from the Gospel according to Luke. First chapter beginning with verse 57 down through verse 66 and then picking up with chapter 3 verse 1 through 6. Listen that we might hear the word of God. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives has this name. Then they began to mention to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue freed and he began to speak, praising God. 
Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was governor of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Licinius ruler of Abilene, during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, First Presbyterian Church of, uh, of Gallatin. It's good to be with you uh, today. Yes, I paused before I said Gallatin because I've been making <laughs> the rounds in retirement or re-schooling. And uh, I have to remember where I am on a given Sunday. I haven't done honeymoon duty in quite a while. <laughs> so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Let us uh, keep Candace and Greg in our prayers and trust that they're having a great time uh, getting to know each other afresh and anew as, as husband and wife. But it's good to be with you. It's beginning to feel more like uh, we're back in the swing of things. Not totally, but more in the back of the swing of things as we worship in person together. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This past Wednesday evening, NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt informed uh, its television audience that uh, New York City was poised to kick off their year-end holiday season with the lighting of the Christmas tree in Rockefeller Center that night. It reminded me of my first visit to New York City when I was, well, let's say it's close to 60 years ago. It was on a father and son bus trip sponsored by the American Legion post that my father, a World War II veteran, was a member of. I can recall sitting high in our bus, looking out the window, trying to capture every moving sight in the Big Apple. I don't recall a lot, but I do remember riding past the Empire State Building, disappointed that there was not this hole in the street where supposedly King Kong had fallen to his death. I can recall being grossed out watching a hot dog vendor. I hope this won't offend, but he took his index finger and he dug up his nose and then he reached for a hot dog and put it in a bun without wiping his hands. And then there was the sight of these bikers speeding through thick traffic downtown Manhattan, you know, weaving in and out between buses and trucks and, and cars and the like. Oh, I watched them and I, I marveled at them and I had, I wish that I had my 24-inch twin bike <laughs> so I could be down there with them. I later discovered 
that those cyclists were couriers, persons who would carry a letter or a package or a message from one place to another, from one person to another. Uh, now, this was before mandatory, you know, helmets for bikes. Uh, this was well before fax machines, you know, and, 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 and scanners, and, uh, and uh, well before, you know, email and mobile phones, uh, even before FedEx and uh, UPS and Amazon, you know, uh, became in vogue. And there they were in the streets of New York City, you know, carrying their, their urgent messages, their uh, precious packages, their important letters from one office or place of business to another. William Barclay, a world-renowned 20th century New Testament scholar and professor and author of Bible commentaries, labels the opening verses of Luke chapter 3 as the courier of the king. Dr. Barclay's commentary on Luke draws attention to the fact that the entire first half of Luke chapter 3 centers on the activity of the courier dispatched by God to deliver the message of the Messiah's coming. The long anticipated emergence of a king of peace from the line of David promised by the prophet Isaiah and other prophets was soon to come. Uh, he, this king would be born from the line of David uh, in the city of Bethlehem who would lead his people with wisdom and understanding with counsel and might when his time fully had come. So there was this herald announcing the soon arrival of the long-awaited king. And this herald, this messenger, this courier was already on the scene and he was moving about assuming his responsibilities. This courier, uh, considered by Ethan Orthodox churches, uh, was uh, deemed to be the last of the Old Testament prophets and the first of the New Testament proclaimers. He would convey the word of God regarding the coming Christ. He would be the precursor to the Christ, the advance party, if you will, charged with setting the stage for the ministry of the Messiah whose dawn was right there on the horizon. This precursor to the Prince of Peace would be known as a forerunner, the immediate forerunner of the Christ. A forerunner is just, as the term depicts, is one who runs before. A king's uh, courier is that kind of forerunner, who often with horn or bugle in hand would go from village to village, town to town, announcing that the high official would soon arrive. So was the work of this courier for the King of Kings. The era for the emergence of this special envoy, this forerunner, serving again as an advanced party to Messiah's coming, as well as the identity of this messenger, falls in Luke's gospel on the heels of zeroing in on the historical context surrounding this event. The when to Luke is just as important as the who. First the when, 
In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Licinius was ruler of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and, Ca and, and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Luke first gives us this political backdrop. It's that of the Roman Empire in early 1st century AD. And he also adds the religious situation in Palestine that mirrors this same period. It was in that small window of human history when those aforementioned rulers and governors reigned and when the aforementioned high priest ministered it was in that small window that the courier of the king was animated and active, moving about. Luke wanted to take his time in telling us of the precise when that this herald was going about his work. Note further, note further that it was not to any of the rulers or governors or priests mentioned that the word of the Lord came, not to Tiberius or Pontius Pilate, not to Herod or his brother Philip, uh, not to Licinius nor to Annas or Caiaphas did the divine message come. Not to any high and mighty, but rather to the meek and lowly one, the word of God came to a country preacher on the backside of Judea, operating in a wilderness wasteland, son of a little-known Jewish priest named Zechariah, did the word of the Lord come. Friends, I think we would do well to note that so it is when it comes to salvation's work, uh, not to those who sit on political thrones, not to emperors and kings, not to presidents and prime ministers, not even to those with high priestly status does the word of the Lord regularly come. It is through the witness and mission of those of humble hearts and of lowly status that God often elects to speak forth God's word. Now to the who. This son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Oh, he was something of a miracle baby, was he not? Both Zechariah and Elizabeth were well up in age, beyond what most would consider to be childbearing years. It was then that an angel of the Lord named Gabriel paid them a house call and spoke, with them, spoke to them the promise that God was going to give of their union a child, a male child, and they were to name him John. Given Elizabeth's barren state and Zechariah admittedly being an old man, that's what the text says, <laughs> the promise of conceiving a child at their stage of life sounded too preposterous to be true. Zechariah made the mistake of voicing aloud his unbelief, and he was struck dumb. He would not speak again until that which had been promised had come to pass. When asked what the child's name ought be once the child was in this world, still speechless, Zechariah reached for a tablet and he scribbled out his name as John. And no sooner had he done that the text tells us immediately his speech was restored to him. And what did he do? <laughs> he praised God. All the people gathered around could not help but wonder, what special mission is this child being sent to us for? Well, in the passing of time, all would come to know the answer. This 
John, this son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the church has long referred to as John the Baptist. I tend to prefer John the Baptizer because uh, you know, that's what he did. He baptized folk in the Jordan. A baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It was this John that was charged with the assignment of being courier of the king. Frederick Beekner, in his book, Peculiar Treasures, has this to say of John the Baptist. Oh, John didn't fool around, Beekner writes. He lived in the wilderness around the Dead Sea. He subsisted on a starvation diet, and so did his disciples. He wore clothes that even the rum itself people wouldn't have handled. When he preached, it was fire and brimstone every time. The kingdom of God was coming, all right, he said. But if you thought it was going to be a pink tea, you better think again. John prepared for his ministry and practiced his ministry not in the courts of kings, not even in the courts of the temple, but in the wilderness. His pulpit and his rack of towels was out along the banks of the Jordan River. It was in the wilderness that he proclaimed, prepare the way of the Lord. In the wilderness, that place of self-examination, that place of testing and reorientation, that place of retooling and reschooling, it was in the wilderness that John went about fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah his being a fourth teller of the one who would pave the way of the Lord's anointed one. When you have time, perhaps later today, read down further in that third chapter of Luke, at least down through verse 19, and you'll discover that uh, John was no namby-pamby sort of guy. He was a, a, a Spartan of sorts. He, he, he was straight to the point in his teaching and preaching. When those who considered themselves prim and proper showed up at the banks of the Jordan River where he was ministering, John flattered them not. He called them, you brood of vipers. He demanded from them genuine repentance for their forgiveness of sin. John demanded right living on a sincere, in a sincere search for God's will. The call to repent, to turn from wickedness toward God, uh, was not some, you know, uh, slight movement of one's mind, in one's mind, but it was rather a radical change of one's whole being. To see and hear John was to experience a kind of flashback in Hebrew history to the time when Elijah the prophet thundered about in the hills and desert regions of Judea. In fact, when some tried to peg John for who he was and who he was like, they compared him to Elijah having returned to earth. John and Elijah were spokespersons for God, cut from the same cloth. They did not tolerate fools gladly. Look up the name of John the Baptist in a Bible dictionary, and you'll find the following. John the Baptist, the immediate forerunner of Jesus, whose way he was sent to prepare, the precursor of the Messiah. I believe such a statement accurately describes the role that that first century Jewish prophet played in the unfolding story of God's wonderful plan for human salvation. So on this second Sunday of Advent, we find ourselves confronted again by this courier of the Christ who calls us to prepare the way of the Lord in our own hearts, in our own homes, in our own houses of worship, yet again. Uh, we are invited 
to be, even for others, a kind of courier, messenger, to pass on the word of the Lord, to share the good news of what God has done and is doing in Jesus. And so what may we be found uh, this Advent season? Uh, uh, something like that John of old, living and loving and serving in such a way that others will believe that now is the time to hear and to heed the call to repent and to receive the Christ who has come. Amen. In response to the word proclaim, I invite you, those of you who are able and willing, to rise and let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed found printed in our worship program. Friends, what is it that we believe? I believe in God, the Father. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. In so doing, let us remember the words that uh, were penned by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 9, verse 6, and it reads, They who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly. They who sow bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's time for the morning offering.
grateful, O God, for these gifts given in this offering this morning. We dedicate these dollars and cents along with our very lives to the ongoing work of advancing your kingdom purposes in the earth through the church. To the glory of Christ's most holy name. Amen. As we remain standing, let us sing verse 1 and 2 of Lift Up Your Heads, O Mighty Gates. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Luke also tells us in his gospel that people will come from north and south, from east and west, and sit at table in the kingdom. Uh, this is but a foretest, foretaste of that banquet. We know that this is the Lord's table. It's not a Presbyterian table, not a First Presbyterian Church of Gallatin table, it is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all who trust in him to share the feast that he himself has prepared. Let us pray. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent out of love for the world to be our Savior. We praise you for your grace revealed in Jesus and for your goodness manifested by the power of your spirit who sustains all things living. With all you are for us and with all you give to us, we still find ourselves crying out for divine help in time of need. We cry out this morning on behalf of neighbors far and near whose lives are weighed down by the troubles of this world. We pray for Christians still in Afghanistan, striving to practice their faith with integrity in that Taliban-controlled land. Oh God, grant them freedom to practice their faith protect them day and night. We pray for Christian missionaries held hostage in Haiti. Grateful are we for those missionaries that have been released and we continue to press on in prayer until all have been set free. We pray for neighbors to the north of us in Oxford, Michigan, as they seek to find their way through the trauma of yet another school shooting that has left victims in its wake. We intercede this morning on behalf of mental health workers and spiritual leaders in that community, for school administrators and law enforcement officers, for parents and teachers and guidance counselors, for all who seek to bring about healing and renewed hope in that community today. 
Comfort and heal, O Lord, as only you can. We pray for those who are excited in their new walks of life, especially for those who have recently been wed, such as Pastor Candace Klein and Greg Howell. We ask, O Lord, that your fullest benediction will rest, rule, and abide upon their marriage. May their time away be sweet and may their return find them energized to continue to engage the work of ministry and mission here in Gallatin. Oh God, we boldly ask for your presence and providential care to come upon all those for whom we pray this morning. We do ask for guidance for the lost, correction for the wayward, salvation for the sinking, and your peace and hope for all who are without it. With deep and abiding gratitude, we come to this table that represents the highest of human hopes and the promise of eternal life now and always through Jesus. We remember here at this table how he broke bread and he poured the cup to make us partakers of his divine presence. Bless, we pray, these common elements of wheat and wine. Sanctify them by your spirit for holy use in this hour. May they be for us the bread of life and the cup of salvation. For it's through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And hear us as we further pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray while saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One loaf. Many as we are, we are one body. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we give thanks over the cup, is it not the sharing of the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
you have not, let us eat together. As the cups are passed, you may, you may sup. Gracious and generous God, thank you for all the precious promises associated with partaking of this sacred meal. Help us to be more fully and faithfully followers of Jesus so that the world might come to know him and believe him and walk with us in the way of faith and life. In his name we ask it. Amen. 
Let us rise now, if able and willing, to sing the next two stanzas of our, of our hymn. of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may be carriers of the good news about the Christ who has come to this world to be its Savior. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you all both now and always. Amen. Thank you. 